again, I wish I could have visited uh, Vienna in person. We tried to get the times to work, but it just didn't really work out. Um, I couldn't come to Europe twice um, in a very short period of time. So I'm having to give this online, and I'm sure you all are quite familiar with this now. Um, and so just to, to sort of get started, the, the main issue I'm going to be discussing today is this well-known antagonism between um, selection and recombination. And um, as you know, um, divergent natural selection uh, drives populations apart, whereas gene flow and recombination uh, bring them back together, basically homogenize uh, populations. And evolutionary biologists have been aware of this antagonism for a long time. Um, in fact, the early critics of Darwin's theory of natural selection, um, of Darwin's origin of species, um, basically they wondered how uh, new evolutionary changes could become established without being swamped out by mating with non-adapted individuals. And um, they came up with a solution. And I think you all know the solution. It was geographic isolation. Obviously, if populations are um, geographically isolated, there can be no um, uh, gene flow or recombination between them. And uh, this was obviously an intellectually very appealing um, um, alternative. And in fact, in the 20th century, there were some evolutionary biologists who thought that all speciation um, involved some type of geographic isolation. However, the problem is, is that in reality, particularly in the 21st century, more and more examples were discovered where speciation had obviously occurred in the presence of gene flow. And so this sort of gave rise not only to, to a challenge for the field, and that is, is and, and this is stated by Coyne and Orr in 2004, in the absence of geographic barriers, sexual recombination is considered to be the greatest obstacle to speciation. And so I'm gonna be talking about this antagonism in the context of ecotype formation. And I think all of you know what ecotypes are, right? And when you have uh, uh, species that are found across multiple, uh, that range across different habitats, we find that there's local adaptation to these different habitats throughout the range and these locally adapted forms are typically called ecotypes. Sometimes they're called ecological races. And I've shown a few of the classic examples here, right? These are the uh, stream and lake stickleback, uh, uh, um, stream and lake sticklebacks, the inland and coastal forms of, of monkey flowers. These are these marine snails and these are whip-tailed lizards. And as you guess, uh, based on the introduction, I'm going to be talking about uh, ecotypes in wild sunflowers. And just to give you a little introduction, a very brief introduction to wild sunflowers, there are about 50 species across North America. The ecotypes are, um, the different species are adapted to different environments, and often within species you find ecotypes that can be found in very different environments. And we think that these ecotypes represent the first stages of speciation, and I'll show you that in a bit. Um, we also have extensive genomic and genetic resources for wild sunflowers, in part because um, they are the wild relatives of the cultivated sunflower. And, and so all of these wild relatives, or many of them, are actually cross-compatible with the cultivated sunflower and have been used as a source of genetic variation for breeding. Okay, so this is what these ecotypes can look like. This is probably the most dramatic example. These are dune and non-dune ecotypes of the prairie sunflower healing of this pedialaris. And um, you can see, in fact, here up on the dunes, you can see this yellow. Um, that's actually the sunflower, but you also can see them up higher up. They actually are, occur. Um, they're sort of the, the keystone species on these dunes. And then down, Below the dunes, we call this creatively the non-dune ecotype. Um, you can see that these uh, the sunflowers also occur on the, the sand sheet uh, below the dunes. Um, and this is another example that we'll be also talking about today. These are ecotypes of, of the silverleaf sunflower. These were discovered by one of my former students, Brooke Moyers. And um, in this case, we have a, uh, a late flowering inland ecotype and an early flowering coastal ecotype. And these are these are found on the sulf, on the uh, 
um, on the Gulf Coast of Texas, and you can see the ecotype, the inland ecotype is found inland, of course, and then the uh, coastal ecotype is actually mainly found on the barrier islands of the Gulf of Mexico. And so I'm really, what I'm gonna be talking about then is the, genetic, the genetics of adaptation. What is the genetic architecture of these locally adapted traits in sunflower ecotypes? And then the second question is, is how are these ecotypes maintained in the presence of gene flow? And of course, that is where the antagonism between selection and recombination comes in. So um, a lot of the data I'll be presenting today comes from, um, a, a started with a, a, a large or a very long collection trip. This collection trip was um, conducted by a former postdoc, Dylan Burge, and he basically just drove um, from Canada to Mexico and all around collecting wild sunflowers. And he did something else that was really important. Um, at each site where he collected the wild sunflowers, he also collected soil, four samples of soil from each site. So we had that, that soil information as well. And he collected three species, the common sunflower, uh, which is Helianthus annuus. This is the progenitor of the domesticated sunflower. Helianthus pedialaris, which I already introduced you to, which is the prairie sunflower. And then Helianthus argophyllus, the silver leaf sunflower. And annuus and pedialaris are widespread species and they're overlapping their geographic distribution throughout most of, the, of, of, the, of their ranges. Um, and then, um, whereas uh, Helianthus argophyllus is down here on the Gulf Coast of, of Texas. And we grew up uh, plants from each of these collections in a common garden at the University of British Columbia. This is the Helianthus annuus common garden. And then um, two of my really uh, uh, sort of most capable uh, research associates, Marco Tedesco. Marco now has an assistant professor position um, at the Michael Smith Labs at UBC and then Natalia Berkovich. And they led a phenotyping effort where they phenotyped about 1500 plants in these common gardens for more than 80 phenotypic traits. But we also of course measured soil characteristics and uh, climate variables. And this just shows the data. We, they resequenced uh, about 1500 genotypes and then um, um, called SNPs um, and we had anywhere between 78 and 200 or so million SNPs, depending on the species. And then we filtered these down to about 4 million SNPs that I'll be talking about uh, today. And this just shows the relationships among the species involved in these collections. Uh, one of the things that we found was is that not all the individuals that um, were thought to be Helianthus pedialaris, they turned out to be another species, Helianthus nivius canescens. All right. so. Um, once we had these data, we conducted what are called genome-wide association analyses or genotype by environment analyses, or GWA or GEA analyses. And then all these analyses do is they look for associations between nucleotide variation or SNPs and um, uh, phenotypic traits or climate variables or soil variables. And typically in, in a species like sunflower, these are, are outcrossing species with large effective population sizes. When we do a GWAS or GA analysis, we actually typically map down to a single gene or regulatory uh, region. But in this study, for many traits, we found sort of a surprising result. And that is we found very large signal plateaus. Um, and we're gonna be calling these haploblocks uh, for some traits. And that's because we're seeing strong linkage to equilibrium. That is all of these SNPs across these regions are associated. And you can see this here. This is, cal this is a, a GEA analysis for soil fertility or cation exchange capacity in Helianthus pedialaris. And what you see is that um, for some of these hits, um, this is the, so this is a Manhattan plot. These are chromosomes on the x-axis and then the um, significance on the y-axis and the red line um, is a, a base factor of 20. And so anything above that, that red line is considered to be significant. And so you see these broad signal plateaus um, that are, um, instead of single genes that are associated with soil fertility. And we found an even larger ones in Helianthus annuus. This is a haploblock for flowering time that's more than 100 megabase pairs. 
just to give you some perspective, this is two thirds of, of the size of the Arabidopsis genome. Um, it's, it's several thousand genes. So I'm gonna talk now about um, what do these haploblocks do? Um, what's their role in, in adaptation and speciation with, with gene flow? And I'm first gonna talk about this case study with the silverleaf sunflower, um, Helianthus argophyllus. And as I mentioned, there are these two ecotypes, this um, tall late flowering ecotype that occurs inland and a short early flowering ecotype that occurs on the barrier islands and, and a little bit on the coast. Um, and when we uh, did uh, genome-wide association analyses with this for flowering time, we found this very large haploblock at the bottom of chromosome six. And you can see it down here, it stretches about 30 megabases. And it explains about 75 to 80% of the variation for flowering time, about a 77 day difference in flowering or um, um, two and a half months. And if you look at this more closely, you can see it's, it's, it's um, this is just showing the genotypes of the early and late flowering um, ecotypes. And you can see that um, across this 30 megabase region, we do see a handful of recombinations, but there are none within this 10 megabase region that shows the strongest association with flowering type. Also, you'll find that there's a funny gap here, right, in the GWAS signal. If you look at this more closely, it turns out that this is where a very important family of genes maps to. And this is something we knew about from previous work by Ben Blackman in my lab. And that is that this family of flowering locus T genes is mapping to this region. And for those of you who don't know plant genes very well, so um, flowering locus T is, it's the protein of flowering locus T that moves from um, leaves to the apical meristem to trigger flowering. And so it's actually the fabled florigen hormone that no one could find for many years. It's actually the protein of that T. And so this is a really key um, um, flowering time gene. And it was interesting that it maps to, to this region. So obviously these are good candidates. And if we look at it more closely, closely we find that actually one of these genes, um, HAFT1, which we had previously shown to be involved in a, as a domestication uh, gene in, in cultivated sunflower actually is missing in, um, in the late flowering ecotype. It's just completely gone. If you look at the um, early flowering ecotype, you can see it's there and it's also found in heterozygotes. And so Marco looked at this in more detail. He found that indeed we couldn't amplify the um, FT1 in late flowering individuals. We also couldn't find it in their cDNA. And then he uh, did heterologous complementation of the Arabidopsis mutant for FT and found indeed that we could complement the Arabidopsis mutant. So what this means simply is, is that this FT1 uh, uh, gene from early flowering Helianthus argophyllus is indeed uh, uh, functional. And so more recently, one of my graduate students, uh, Mariana Pasquale, has been working in Texas um, to actually measure the effects of this one haploblock on reproductive isolation. And so what she's been doing is she's been taking uh, seeds from different flowering heads and genotyping them and finding out uh, whether they're re the result of uh, crosses between ecotypes or within ecotypes. And, and what she finds is, is that this one reproductive barrier actually has a, has a fairly strong barrier in, with um, a reproductive isolation strength. So on the coast, the um, flowering time acts as a fairly strong barrier, but that's because the other, the um, early flowering ecotype is not very common. Whereas on the island, both ecotypes are, are present and you can see it still causes fairly strong isolation ranging from about 0.62 for the uh, early flowering ecotype to about 0.83 for the late uh, flowering ecotype. So with silverleaf sunflower, you can see that this is a case where we're in the very early, earliest stages of speciation, but this haploblock is um, contributing to reproductive isolation. And I should say that there are other traits that map to this haploblock region that seem to be unrelated to flowering time. Uh, for example, uh, low nutrient tolerance, um, greater nitrogen use efficiency on the dune, on the, the um, uh, plants that are found in the very sandy soils on the barrier islands. 
Okay, so now I want to take a, a, a second case study uh, where in this case we're much closer to being uh, speciation being complete. In fact, um, by many definitions, these would be good species rather than ecotypes. And so this involves the prairie sunflower. Um, and if you look at this map, you can see the geographic distribution of the prairie sunflower. It's widespread throughout the central and western United States. It's usually found in sort of stable sand, sandy soils like you can see up here. Um, but in some cases, we actually find it on these very unstable sand dunes. And um, there are two sort of very distinctive and independently evolved ecotypes that have um, appeared on these sand dunes. These are ecotypes that we discovered uh, through uh, collecting a number of years ago. And you can see this one ecotype is here on the Great Sand Dune National Park and Preserve. That's the um, photo I showed you earlier. And the second one is on the Monaghan Sandhills uh, State Park. And I'm going to focus a little bit here on the Great Sand Dunes National Park. Um, these are 200 to 230 me meter high mega dunes. And so the dune ecotype occurs on the dunes and the sand dune ecotype right here um, off of just off the dunes. And as I mentioned before, and then there's forest behind the mountains and forest. And, and the biggest difference between the dune and non-dune ecotypes is simply seed size, right? Um, the dunes have very large seeds, non-dune have small seeds. Um, but the dune plants also flower later. They have much greater nitrogen use efficiency because um, um, dunes are very low in, in nutrients. And, and before we even knew about the haploblocks um, in, involved in the system, we knew that there was um, um, we had measured uh, gene flow between uh, the dune and non-dune populations. And what you find is, is that there's a bit more um, um, gene flow from the dune to the non-dune than the other direction. But if you look at these um, um, migration rates, um, sort of immigration rates, it's 2.4 to 6.6 .6 migrants per generation um, from the dune to the non-dune and about 0.6 to 4.4 immigrants the other direction. This is sort of moderate levels of gene flow, and it's enough gene flow to keep the populations from diverging through, uh, to, to keep the ecotypes from diverging through uh, genetic drift. And so you have to actually have divergent natural selection to create the differences between these ecotypes. So gene flow clearly is ongoing. Uh, we also, one of my uh, former grad students, now a, a prof at University of California, Riverside, Kate Ostovic, carried out a reciprocal transplant experiment on these dunes. Um, and this was a, a heroic effort, I should say. This is a very difficult environment to do reciprocal transplants on. And you can see the obvious reason why, right? Um, here's her transplant experiment right below this enormous dune. And of course, most of our ex transplant experiments over the years have been destroyed. Um, often by blowing sand, but just as frequently um, by uh, herbivores. It turns out these are the only green things on the dunes, and when you plant out seedlings out on the dunes, they're just come back the next day and they're gone. And so it, it's quite a battle. But she was able to, to carry this out. This is the non-dune site. And the results uh, make sense, right? They're actually quite intuitive. Not surprisingly, the dune seeds, um, or the um, I should say large seeds, can see seed weight is on the x-axis here and survival probability on the y-axis. This just shows the seed sizes of the, um, the non-dune plants, the dune plants, and their F1s. You can see a big maternal effect. And then the back cross is where the maternal effect is washed away. And um, uh, what you find is, is that not surprisingly, large, do, large seeds do very well in the dune habitat, whereas there's really makes no difference in the non-dune habitat. However, the non-dune plants produce a lot more seeds on the sand sheet than the dune plants. And this is because they produce more flowers, right? So you can see this here. Um, this is height. You can see that the non-dune plants um, on, at the non-dune um, common garden are taller. They produce more flowers. They produce more seeds. So you have a classic trade-off. And when you sort of... Um, use aster models to combine the various fitness components, you get what you'd expect, right? Strong local adaptation where the non-dune plants do best in the non-dune habitat. Uh, 
The dune plants do best in the dune habitat, and the hybrids perform poorly in both habitats. And, and Kate went on and measured all the different reproductive areas across the life cycle of these ecotypes and found that surprisingly, total reproductive isolation is quite strong. It's uh, greater than uh, 0 0.99. So there's actually, there is some obviously gene flow which we documented, but it's not um, um, uh, very much. And if you look at um, um, the reproductive barriers individual, you can see that, by the way, sorry, my son is, I expected this might happen. You can hear him yelling, he'll be gone soon. Um, so uh, um, this is immigrant and viability. This just means that um, plants from one habitat do poorly in the habitat of the other. Um, this is flowering time. It contributes fairly weakly to the reproductive isolation. So this is pollinator isolation. It just simply means that these plants are found in different habitats. And so, um, and it turns out there's a different set of pollinators in the two habitats. In fact, Kay, uh, Kate discovered two new species of bees um, on the dunes. Um, and this is conspecific pollen precedence. It turns out that Dune moms prefer pollen from dune dads, and non-dune moms prefer pollen from non-dune dads. And then, but we found no intrinsic postzygotic barriers, but we do find poor selection against hybrids. So where do the apple blocks come in? Well, when you look at the distributions of these apple blocks in Helianthus pedialaris, what you find is, is that they, a lot of them, map to the dunes. For example, here you can see a haplotype, uh, there's a unique haplotype mapping both to the Colorado and to the Texas dunes. Same thing here for this one on chromosome nine. Um, and we see the same thing here on chromosome 11. Don't worry about the, the different coloring that was arbitrary when we were making the figures. And then this one on, on chromosome 14. And it turns out, I suspect as you might have guessed, is that the dune specific traits map to these large haploblocks. Um, this is the part of the, uh, uh, you've seen part of this um, uh, GEA analysis earlier, the one on cation, cation exchange capacity, but you can see that seed size, uh, days to flowering, um, and cation exchange capacity all map to these large haploblocks that differentiate these ecotypes. And if you look at FST, which is a common measure of genetic differentiation, you can see that most of the high FST values also map to these um, um, haploblocks. And if we extend this one step further and look at reproductive isolation, we find indeed that uh, most reproductive barriers map to the haplobots. Um, for example, immigrant and viability, flowering time, indirectly um, the pollinator isolation, because we know that the pollinators are found on different habitats and the immigrant and viability, of course, is the mapping to, is the, the fact that these ecotypes are found on different habitats. We have yet to, to, to map um, um, uh, on specific pollen precedents, but we also know, of course, that uh, um, extrinsic isolation against hybrids also maps to the haploblocks. So this is a case where these haploblocks, these sort of low recombination regions of the genome that are segregating within species actually have played a, a really major role in the allowing these ecotypes to diverge in the presence of gene flow. So are there more of these? So this is a, a study that was, um, so the, um, uh, one of my uh, former uh, postdocs, Greg Owens, um, used a program called uh, local PCA or um, population structure or low strut. And basically what this program does is it looks for regions of the genome that have a different ge uh, uh, geographic structure than, or a different population structure than other regions of the genome. And the idea then is that these regions would therefore be probably targets of local adaptation. And in fact, it worked wonderfully in sunflowers. You get these just you know, really uh, very clear outlier regions. Um, and so this is chromosome five. Um, and they act, um, they act like structural variants, such as inversions. For example, um, here is the principal component analysis for a haploblock, um, this haploblock on chromosome five. 
And what we find is we find these three uh, clusters, and we assume that these represent the zero, zero homozygous, um, the heterozygous, and then the one, one haplotypes for a structural variant. And under this model, we would expect that the zero, one uh, cluster would have higher heterozygosity, and it does. And we also find that we get very high differentiation between the haplotypes at the uh, in a given haplobloc. Um, for example, here we are in chromosome five again. You can see that FST is close to zero until we get to the haplobloc, and then we have very high FST. And you can see the breakpoints are really the the uh, there's a very abrupt change between the low and high FST at the, the breakpoints. And so are these really inversions? Um, yes, it turns out most of them are. Um, and I suspect that you, you have guessed this already. And, and we figure this out using sort of standard approaches. We compared reference genomes. For example, these are two different cultivar genomes uh, showing you they have the same gene order for most of the chromosome. And then you get these uh, two inversions back to back that create that um, haplobloc. And we also... Um, used evidence from genetic mapping and from high C sequencing. And what we found that many, but not all haploblocks are associated with one or more large inversions. And so why does this matter? Where Well, inversions and other structural variants suppress recombination of heterozygotes. And so that's the key uh, uh, to their importance in local adaptation. And what this means is, is they're able to keep locally adapted alleles together, therefore, um, um, resolving the antagonism between divergent natural selection and recombination. And this is just shown here in this uh, uh, figure from Mark Patrick's paper, where you have here is uh, two individuals that differ by um, an inversion. And uh, so in your F1, if you, if you get no recombination, um, obviously you end up back with the parental um, uh, inversion haplotypes. And if you do get recombination, what happens is typically you get um, uh, deletions and duplications, which results in inviolable gametes. Now, we've actually looked at for, for this, for these inviolable gametes in sunflowers, and we don't find them. Uh, we see this for interspecific uh, comparisons uh, between inversions that differ between species, but we don't see them. We don't see inviolable gamete production. Uh, within species. And we think that this is because these are simply abort uh, uh, very early in the developmental stage so that we, they don't actually develop into pollen. Um, so the costs are actually quite low. And this is a summary of the haplobox. Um, in these three species, we found 37, um, eight are simple inversions, 11 are complex rearrangements. So this just means typically back to back inversions, two, three, four inversions back to back. Um, two of them do not seem to be structural variants, um, and we can talk about why that is. And then we're still, we actually have tested a number of these, but I haven't updated the figure, but the, the, this, the, the, this, this holds in general. Um, and the size ranges from about 100, 1 to 100 uh, omega-base pairs. So what do these do? Well, we've already shown you what they do. They actually, um, they're associated with, with many different phenotypic traits, climate variables, and soil characteristics. We sort of combine the 80 traits and all the climate and soil variables um, um, in this graph here. And, and what you can see is that in many cases, um, um, many different traits map to the same um, haplobox, whereas in other cases, um, uh, like here, we only find a single trait. However, and in some cases, we still don't know what the haplobox do, although we're working on that. Um, but the bottom line is, is it does look like that these maintain combinations of locally adapted alleles. So where do they come from? Well, the surprising thing, um, I guess it's not surprising since this is similar to what people have found in other groups, is that the haplobloks turn out to be highly divergent. Um, this is an example here of that chromosome 5 haploblock. And um, here's haplotype 0 in Helianthus annuus. Here's haplotype 1. Haplotype zero is where you'd expect it to be in the phylogenetic tree, sister to Helianthus argophilus, whereas sap haplotype two actually is basal to all of the annual sunflowers and maybe even the perennial sunflowers. So it's it's really quite quite ancient. And if we look at all of these, we find that most, with one exception, seem to uh, most of them. I guess there are several exceptions. 
seem to predate the splits between the uh, species or subspecies. And so where do they come from? Well, there is some evidence they're actually coming uh, via introgression from other species, um, both extant and extinct species. Um, this is a case in, um, in Helianthus argophilus. This is that chromosome six haploblock involved in flowering. And here is the late flowering haploblock, which is where it's supposed to be as sister to Helianthus annuus. But then the early one is clearly derived by via recent introgression uh, from Helianthus annuus. And it's interesting that this is actually the one with the functional FT. And so in this case, a species has regained um, a function uh, via introgression from a related species. And so the derived situation is, 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 is functional. Uh, we think with the sand types that they have um, originated from probably um, uh, from an extinct non-dune, um, extinct dune-like ancestor. So what we think is going on is, is that most of these dunes actually are very recent. They don't last very long, for example. The Colorado dunes are no more than 50,000 years old. And obviously, even um, during the last ice age, there's no way there could have been any sunflowers on the dunes. It would have been too cold. And so what we think is, is that these haploblocks are, are, are retained in the standing variation. And these various dune ecotypes or species form again and again and again, and then disappear. Um, one of the surprising things is, so if, you know, we have these, we're making the case that these inversions or other haploblocks are important because they can um, hold locally adapted alleles together. So then the question is, well, why don't we have more of them? Uh, why do we need recombination? And of course, the problem with a lack of recombination is twofold, right? One is, is that it's more difficult to purge deleterious mutations. The other is, is that it reduces the rate of adaptation by it makes it more challenging to bring adaptive alleles together. Um, however, when we looked at this in, in sunflower, at least when we looked at the deleterious mutations, surprisingly, we didn't find any excess of deleterious mutations relative to the genomic background. You can see this here. We had to categorize the genomic regions into um, sort of areas with almost no recombination, areas with reduced recombination and high recombination, so we could calibrate these, these comparisons. But you can see if you compare the sort of uh, the genome-wide uh, variation in those genome-wide uh, level of deleterious mutations in those regions relative to the inversions, there's just no difference in any of these comparisons. Um, here there is a difference, but it's the genome-wide estimate has more deleterious mutations than the inversion. Um, However, when we actually just restrict our attention to populations that are polymorphic for the inversions, where you actually can have inversion heterozygotes and get reduced recombination, uh, we find that in fact, we do see the predictive pattern where the inversions have more deleterious mutations than those in monomorphic uh, populations. And um, so the key here to sort of minimizing the accumulation of deleterious mutations in Helianthus is the high homozygosity of inversions in these species. And this is because these inversions are adapted to different local environments. And so the populations that are polymorphic are just at the interface between these different um, ecotypes. And so um, um, they're actually quite rare. And uh, um, so we get this excess homo homozygosity relative to sort of your genome-wide SNPs. And what this means then is that these inversions really are, are quite ideal, right, as recombination modifiers because they permit locally adapted alleles to be held together, but they also seem to escape the, um, the, the, the accumulation of deleterious mutations. And I don't know if I explained that. So when you have inversion of the homozygous, you can which is the case in most populations of helianthus, you can actually purge deleterious mutations just like in any other part of the genome. All right, so um, I can we can wrap this up now. So we see that these sunflower ecotypes are differentiated by massive haploblocks. They're associated with numerous adaptive traits and environmental variables. They are caused mainly by large inversions and structural variants, and they act to suppress recombination. 
And as I mentioned just in the previous slide, they're ideal recombination modifiers because recombination is suppressed in heterozygotes only. And in many cases, they seem to be derived via introgression. And so they, they seem to play a major role in evolution by reducing recombination between locally adapted alleles and or those um, contributing to reproductive isolation. Um, I should point out that this is that what we're finding in sunflower is being found in a host of other species. Um, they were first, first found in, in Drosophila more than a century ago, and now um, it seems like any species where you have ecotype formation, almost all of them, you see these inversions popping up and playing a major role in, 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 in ecotype differentiation. So um, basically, I, I see these haploblocks or inversions or other structural variants or any kind of recombination modifier as offering a, a general solution for resolving the antagonism between selection and recombination that, that so uh, worried um, many evolutionary biologists over the past century. All right, so before I, I wrap this up, I wanted to thank everyone who, who did the work. This work is funded um, by a number of different agencies, obviously in Canada mainly, um, but also the National Science Foundation through our collaborators. I have shown really uh, three um, in the, the large photos of the six people who really did this work. Um, Marco Tedesco and Natalia Berkovich were the main uh, players in this, but the bioinformatics was done by Greg Owens, uh, J.S. Lagar and, and one of my grad students, Kai Chi Huang, and then Kate Ostovic, of course, did that wonderful work um, in the uh, sand dunes of Colorado. And so, um, and of course, here's my lab and some of my other collaborators. So I want to thank them. And that's it. Thanks uh, for listening to me.